bold faith stands on the shoulders of quiet trust. All God was looking for from me was just to hold the course and trust. That was it. I was looking for great demonstrations of faith. I was looking for great demonstrations of breakthrough. And the only thing I, the only thing I had was to be quiet and just cultivate trust. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks. Sure good to see you. Good morning, good morning. I just got back from Taiwan. It was wonderful. I, I let all our Taiwanese friends that are here, I let them know Friday night that it, I left it in good order. I didn't break anything. Country's still running. It's all still good. It's such a wonderful time. We have so many good friends all over, all over Asia. Actually, I was in China a couple weeks ago and Korea, came home and then went to uh, Taiwan just because I didn't have anything else to do. So. But sure had a good time. A lot of, God's just doing so much all over that part of the world. Um, do, you know what you, do you know what the correct term is for gluten-free, sugarless, vegan brownies? Compost. Yes, amen. Amen. I... <laughs> A scientific study was done that proved that women who add a few extra pounds live longer than the men who mention it. <laughs> That's a very reliable study. Being cremated is my last hope for a smoking hot body. <laughs> That's just gross, isn't it? <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> if you see me eating a salad in a restaurant, I have been kidnapped. <laughs> and I'm trying to signal you. <laughs> oh, I think that's funny. I... It's more funny when my wife is here because she, she, she does this. She goes, she just closes her eyes and shakes her head. When she's upset at me, I hear my full name. It's Bill Johnson. It's not just Bill. It's just I hear my last name too. So actually, it's not when she's upset. She doesn't get upset at me. But my, my love language is to tease. So I... Yeah, sorry. Sorry about that. One more. Two elderly couples were enjoying friendly conversation when one of the men asked the other, Fred, how was the memory clinic you went to last month? Outstanding, Fred said. They taught us all the latest psychological techniques, visualization, association, etc. It was great. So that's amazing. So what was the name of the clinic? Frank went blank. He thought and thought but couldn't remember. Then a smile broke across his face, and he asked, what do you call that flower with a long stem and thorns? And he responds, you mean a rose? He says, yes, that's it. Fred turned to his wife and said, Rose, what was, <laughs> what was the name of that memory uh, That's that pretty pitiful. <laughs> that's just plain pitiful. All right. <laughs> Open your Bibles to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 3. We're going to read a few verses out of chapter 3 and then uh, a few more out of uh, chapter 4. But let me give you a context. I want to talk to you about the way of faith. And, uh, you know, faith, faith is supposed to be normal for a believer. That's why we're called believers. Yeah, amen. It's actually, it's actually in our nature, in Christ, to believe the one who's perfectly faithful. The Spirit of God 
took up residence in us. And he exudes confidence in the Father. And all of our relationship with the Holy Spirit leads to faith, leads to confidence in God. Unfortunately, we have images of hype, we have images of control, we have images of so many other things that have nothing to do with faith. But I want to talk to you about pure and simple faith. It's vital and it has to be important to us because faith is one of the two absolutes that heaven anticipates in the heart of every believer. The two absolutes are love and faith. We know that there's faith, hope, and love, and love is the greatest of these. But then we also know in Hebrews 11 it says that without faith it's impossible to please him. I, I know there's a part of, of life where we, we don't have to do anything to please God. He actually just delights in us who we are, as we are made in his image. I get that. But we can't discount the fact that faith pleases him. There's something about our response to who he is that brings great pleasure to his own heart. I, some, of the, some of the stories that move me the most in the New Testament are where, where you have Jesus with a centurion who demonstrates a level of faith that no one in all of Israel demonstrated the Syrophoenician woman who wanted her daughter healed and delivered. And, uh, and Jesus was explaining to her that he had to minister to the Jew first and not the Gentile. And she rose above that into a place of faith and he was stunned. And I don't know what you do with this, but, but to, for God to be in awe of you yeah. is amazing. To, for him to stop in his tracks and go, wow, I'm impressed. He was so moved by the offering of Mary who poured out the ointment, years worth of, of, of income to purchase this ointment, poured it out over him. He was so stunned by the act, the act that he announced that this will be spoken of forever. This, this story of this offering, of this sacrifice will actually be on record and talked about for all of eternity. And so it's, it's, it should matter to us that there's actually things that we can do that really, that really touches heart in unique ways. It's not, uh, it's not Christian calisthenics. It's not performing so that he'll love us. It, it, we can't cause him to love us any more than he loves us. But there is this element of bringing pleasure to the heart of God that is, uh, is so special. And, and I just bless the children and, and don't ever feel bad if you have a child in here that cries. I don't, I don't mind. It's part of life. In fact... I, I was reading earlier, uh, earlier that D.L. Moody had a meeting once where the only people who could come to the meeting were moms with babies in their arms. They, so it was a, I'm sure it was crazy, but it was, it was God showed up and, and, and Chris got gray hair in that meeting. Just totally went white. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, don't, honestly, don't ever feel, feel bad. Faith is, um, faith is actually the most normal response to the discovery of who he is. Because all it is, is a confidence in his nature, in his word. And so unbelief creeps in where we're unsure. If you don't have questions in life, you're intellectually brain dead. <laughs> we're supposed to have questions. It's vital to have questions. But questions that are raised in the atmosphere of trust lead to revelation. Questions that arise in the attitude of mistrust lead to unbelief. You see, Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, when the angel showed up and announced the great news that his wife was going to give him a son, he said, how can I know this is for sure? And Gabriel says, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. You know, like that should be enough evidence. But um, the Lord made Zechariah silent for nine months, probably so he wouldn't mess up the miracle. Because many miracles are aborted by what we say. So here's this question that really held God hostage to an answer. Questions are normal for the believer. 
because you can't develop que a trust without questions. Yeah. You have to have mystery or you can't develop a life of trust. Yeah. That's right. There's no need for trust if there's no mystery, if there's no questions. It's actually essential that you live in the middle of things that you can't control, you can't explain. Yeah. Some things you don't like, some things you're overwhelmed by that are beyond anything you know you could ever earn or deserve, and you live in the middle of this mystery, and that's where trust is cultivated. So without those elements, you cannot possibly develop a life of trust that he is looking for from each of his own. Faith pleases him. If you look at me with uh, first, uh, or excuse me, Second Corinthians chapter three, we're going to jump into the middle of the subject because I, I don't want to. I actually don't want to deal with the broad subject that's being talked about. It'll take too much time for, for this morning's session. But I do want to, he's, he's dealing with the fact that there's a veil over the eyes of the Jews to the reality of Christ, all right? So we're going to jump into the middle of that. But the principle that applies there also applies for us. Verse 14, their minds were blinded, for until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Can okay, now listen to that last verse because this provides uh, an insight for us on the life of faith. Faith has to matter to us because this is, our whole life is bringing pleasure to the heart of the Lord. And our dreams are fulfilled when we fulfill his dreams. In the same way that Joseph's dreams were fulfilled when he fulfilled the Pharaoh's dreams. And it's just the life we've been called to. It's, it's what's called seeking first the kingdom and all these things will be added. It's just this, this domino effect. And whenever we reverse the order, we lose both. All right, verse 16 again. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. That's fascinating because you would think that the veil would be removed so a person could turn to the Lord. But the, the point that's being made here, and also in chapter four, is that there's a veil of deception that lies over the eyes of people. They're deluded about who God is, about what he has said, what he has promised. There's this realm of deception that exists over the minds of people. In chapter four, it says, he has blinded their minds. Blinded their minds. The implication is minds see. So he's blinded their minds to reality, to truth. And yet it says when they believe, the veil is lifted. The veil isn't lifted so they can believe. Why? Because faith doesn't come from the mind. Faith comes from the heart. So no matter the level of deception that exists over a person, there's always enough Holy Spirit activity there's, already, there's always enough going on in the spirit of a person to yield to the Lord so that deception is removed. The point is, faith comes first, first understanding comes second. Faith comes first, understanding comes second. We know that in Hebrews 11, it says, by faith, we understand the worlds were made out of nothing. By faith, we understand faith came first. Why? Because the Lord is looking for people who yield, who surrender from here, not just here. He's not asking us to adopt his principles. He's not urging us to embrace biblical principles so we have a successful life. He's urging us to embrace the principle one the Lord, yielding. See, faith is the result of surrender, not striving. You don't work yourself into faith. And one of the biggest enemies of a life of faith is busyness. It's not that busyness is wrong, it's just without that place of, of quiet anchoring the soul in who God is and what he has said, we become easily persuaded and swayed by popular opinion, public opinion, by the movement of the day. And that anchor of the soul that just finds its rest in the nature of God and the word of God, that's where that element of trust gets developed in the middle of craziness and chaos. 
This verse goes on, it says, uh, verse 16, it says, nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Verse 17, now the Lord is the Spirit. That's interesting statement, the Lord is the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Lord. The Holy Spirit is Lord. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Another way to put that is wherever the Holy Spirit is Lord, liberty is the evidence. The evidence of the presence of God, not just in the room. I mean, no, he can be in the room, but you, I can resist him and not yield to him, right? So it's not just the presence of the Lord in this sense. It's the presence of the Lord in this sense that he has had his, his impact of lordship over my perception, over my thinking, over my heart. There's a place of tenderness and yieldedness. See, my, my life's goal is to be tender enough to the Lord that he can touch me with his fingerprint and leave his imprint on my heart. I want to be that tender, that soft and tender to his, that any breath moves me, any breath of God moves my thinking, moves my actions. We really do play to the audience of one. We really do live to the audience of one, to bring pleasure to one. And the moment I lose that is when I, I become very frustrated with him. In fact, the way I like to put it, is that if God is your servant, you will constantly be frustrated. He will never measure up. But if you are his servant, you will always stand in amazement, being overwhelmed by how good he really is. There's a shift in posture. And if I fail to make that shift in posture, I will think I have a contract to make demands of God. Instead of realizing he gave himself to me as the contractor so that together we would co-labor to see his purposes carried out. Faith really is the result of being overwhelmingly confident that he is who he says he is. It's normal. So where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. That statement we use a lot. I like it, I like it because it just speaks so much of the kingdom. But it's given to us in this context of blinded minds being released from deception and seeing. That liberty is actually seeing what we're supposed to be seeing. That liberty. Why is it important to see? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> why, why is it important? Why, why is perception so important? Well, obvi there's obvious reasons, but let me tell you the ultimate reason. The ultimate reason, this whole chapter is actually about encountering the glory. In fact, we should read this next verse. This will help it to make more sense. It's real wordy, but let's work through it together. Verse 18, but we all with unveiled face, in other words, the deception's been lifted, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Interesting way to put things. I'm seeing the glory of the Lord, but it's like I'm looking in a mirror. What does that say about what's happening to you? I hope you're getting it. We are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So where the Holy Spirit is Lord, he lifts the veil so that we can see him more clearly. But what happens as a result? Beholding the glory of the Lord is the most transformational encounter a person can and will ever have. When the Bible says, when you see him, you will be like him, that is true. But the principle is also in the present tense, as you see him you will be like him. Many people wait to see some image where Jesus, you know, ta-da, shows up in, in, in almost in the flesh or so that we see him in, in vision form instead of realizing any time we consider who he is and what he has said and we quiet our heart, we just look in his direction, there is an imprint taking place in our lives of who he is. Everything gets recalibrated. Our thoughts get recalibrated. Our values, our decisions, our priorities in life, all this stuff gets recalibrated. The more, the more I become confident and aware that he truly is with me, not just as a promise that I, that I haven't realized personally by experience, but as a promise that I live in. I live in the experience of the abiding presence of Christ. In that context, faith becomes more and more normal, and I become changed into his image. So the whole point is, is that beholding him changes us. You know, you, sometimes with the with way things are emphasized in the church and, and by us, it, it, would, it would almost appear that 
It's by our hard labor that we're changed. And I, I, blew, I do believe in hard labor, and I do believe in, in really rep- representing the Lord with a great zeal, fervency, laying my life down to see him use my labors. But there, there is nothing so transformational as beholding him. Those things are important because I've beheld him. In other words, I don't do these things to obtain favor. I already have the favor. I do them because I have favor. In other words, what are you going to do with what God has given you? You know, if we hold a little baby and look at that little child, and that child doesn't have to do anything. In fact, what it does do is quite offensive. (laughs) And yet we have such favor on that child. We just love that. You know, a friend of mine just had just had a baby here just recently, and uh, and their statement was, "I I didn't know I." I didn't know I could love anything as much as I love this baby. Uh, I'm near. Yeah, it's absolutely true. There's nothing like it. And so that baby doesn't have to do anything for me to love it any more than I do. But if that baby's still laying in the crib when it's 21, you know, <laughs> you might want to light the mattress on fire and see if you can get some motivation going because <laughs> there's got to be some activity that comes from the love that you've displayed. Poor example, but you got my point. All right. <laughs> Chapter four. <laughs> yeah, don't light the mattress on fire. Bad illustration. I have to be careful now. I, my, my third grade sense of humor just bites me every once in a while. All right. Chapter four, down to verse uh, three. It says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. That's just reaffirming verse 16 of the previous chapter. Now I want you to jump over to verse 13. Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak. That statement, I believed, therefore I spoke, Paul is quoting an Old Testament passage here. So what he's doing is he's taking a a principle that was established first in the Old Testament that made it through the cross unchanged and remains in the New Testament. We've, We've looked at this before. Some things ended at the cross, animal sacrifice. Some things were changed by the cross, the nature of the Sabbath, a jubilee. Jubilee is every year for a believer. It was every 50 years for Israel. So some things were changed at the cross, and some things made it through the cross unchanged. And this principle is one of them. I believed, therefore I spoke. Say that with me. I believed, therefore I spoke. Now, I'm sure you've run into horror stories of people who have tried to get their way by confessing whatever they want and announcing the power of their confession. You know, there's a natural power in the confession of a person. You don't even have to be born again. If you say the right things, over time it will have effect on you. But the real power that we're interested in is the power of God, and that is released when we say what he is saying. Discovering what he is saying is the vital part of our life. Jesus set the establ- or established the, the model for us, the standard for us. He said, I only say what I hear my father say. So all the words that came out of his mouth were words he actually heard from the Father. And so when we partner with the Heavenly Father to declare what he is saying, all of heaven waits to ride on that which came from the heart of the Father. The way I describe it, my personal conviction is the angelic realm, uh, it's going to sound a little strange, but they can, they can smell the fragrance of the throne room when you say something that originated in the heart of the Father. I... I I come to that analogy uh, this way. We know that Satan is called Beelzebub, the lord of the flies. Flies are attracted to what? Death, decay. I had a freezer die once out in a shed. It was hell on earth. And it was, it was, it was, oh, it was bad. It was just so bad. It was so bad. I don't know how flies got in there, but there were, more than mankind could count inside this freezer. We didn't empty the freezer. We just took the whole thing to the dump. Just, and all the other freezers that were there just ran away. They just, you know. 
I embellished a little on that part. <laughs> so if Satan is likened unto uh, is, is Beelzebub, Lord of the Flies, flies are attracted by fragrance of decay, then the angelic realm, it would seem to me, would be attracted by life, yeah. the breath of heaven, the very things that God speaks. And according to Psalms 103, Angels carry out the voice of his word. There's something that when we declare what God is saying, they are attracted to that they might enforce. It's true. It is true. It's, it's just learning to partner with God the way that he wants to be partnered with. And so here we have this statement, I believe, therefore I spoke. And then he responds. He says, we also believe and therefore speak. You know, if, if we could... If we could just learn truth and lay aside every bad example we've ever seen, we'd do a lot better. But oftentimes, there are, there are touchy reactions to phrases, to words, to movements, to whatever, because in our mind, we have the worst possible example of that idea. And there are many things that have been rejected by the church. I remember... Uh, years ago, uh, uh, one, of, one of the most amazing men I've ever met said, stay away from the prophetic because it's caused so much shipwreck. Well, he had experienced a number of tragic things. And, and his reaction was, stay away from that because it, it has caused so much damage in the church. And, uh, and I, I, I had so much respect, and, and do, this man's in heaven now, but uh, so much respect for this man. And, uh, but, but, Strangely, his word excited me for the prophetic. It, made, it, it encouraged me because I thought, well, if the devil works that hard to counterfeit something because it has that much power, then, then the real must be all that much more valuable. You know, you don't, ever, you don't ever hear of a counterfeit ring being busted and who counterfeited pennies. You know, I mean, it's, it's not worth the effort. You know, they're only going to counterfeit something of value. And so whenever I see the enemy trying to distort a reality, distort a truth, that actually encourages me, it motivates me. And so, and so what, what his warning did do is it enabled me to take extra steps of caution, and specific, not caution in the sense of fear, but caution in the sense of walking as a team. I remember with team and a number of others, with Chris and a number of others uh, in Weaverville, but just partnering together to make sure that we did this right, stay accountable together as we, as we go places where we don't know anyone who's ever gone there before. It's certainly people have traveled there for years, but we didn't know it. They weren't close to us. And so we had to, like explorers, see if we could find something. And so we'd keep each other accountable, make sure that we're seeking first the kingdom and not our own attention, our own glory, our own title or position or whatever. And some, sometimes that's what you do is you just make that partnership together. You just say, you know what? This way of faith is important to me. And I realize I can make it about what I get. I can make it about you know, how God uses me. I can make it about ministry instead of relationship. Watch me. If you see that, correct me. The slap of a friend is a very valuable thing. But don't change the pursuit. Don't change the pursuit. Oh, I did it wrong. And then you quit. No, that's stupid. If you were responding to something that God said to do, find responding to something that he says pleases him, this lifestyle of faith, then what we do is we walk together. The slap of a friend helps us to walk correctly, in purity, but after the authentic. So here's this issue called, I believe, therefore I spoke. I, this fascinates me because I, I've experimented with it through the years, and still, I, life for me is just one huge experiment. But I, I remember um, being with Randy Clark in Colorado several years ago, and I had been running an experiment for a while there, and any time I was in a meeting, if I... If I said at the beginning, and the Lord would always prompt me, he'd remind me, if I said at the beginning, it is normal for tumors to disappear in the presence of the Lord. If I said that at the beginning of the meeting, at the end, we would check. And I remember this one meeting in, uh, Randy and I were dialoguing on this subject and, uh, in, in Denver. And at, by the end of the meeting, there were nine people that had tumors either completely disappear or were uh, significantly diminished and diminishing. Nine people, and yet what I've noticed is if I don't say that, chances are very high it won't happen. 
Now, is it the power of my speech? No, no, it's just me cooperating with what he's saying. And then his breath is added where his angelic realm enforced the very thing declared. So what are you saying about your life? Sometimes our need for sympathy from friends when we're in the middle of the problem, sometimes we find greater comfort from the sympathy of friends than we do in the comfort of trust and confidence in God. And we'll actually talk talk down. I, I believe in transparency. I believe, you know, I'm hurting. I'm, I need help. Having people, you know, I, I get that. And I think that's vital and that's important. So don't misunderstand me. But, but there's, an, there's another element to this of feeding off the sympathy of friends that sometimes becomes more valuable to us than the place of confidence in God. I was in, uh, I was in uh, New Zealand in this last August and uh, I, I do a particular conference there every year. And I, I think it's been about 12 years I've been going, every year for 12 years. And <clears throat> I was there this time with uh, Michael Maiden, who's a, just a wonderful, wonderful friend and a wonderful man of God. I really want to have him here at some point. He's a great prophet. He's, he's ministered so deeply to me through the years. And um, anyway, I was, I was in this conf- conference, and it was the last night, and and he got up at the end, and he called me up, and he began to prophesy over me. And, I, you know, I've had a lot of good words through the years, and I, I, I treasure them. I record them. I, if there's a video, I, I, I get it downloaded into my iPad so I can sit in my living room and just watch. I had a real rough spot this last year where I was really, really sick. Some of you uh, might remember that one. And I couldn't eat. I couldn't drink water. I couldn't do anything. I was, I was, uh, I was in a, in a rough, rough place. <clears throat> and uh, Michael Maiden called me out and he brought me up. He, says, he, said, he said, Pastor Bill, he says, God won't leave me alone on this. And he said, I wouldn't do this otherwise. And then he began to bring this word. And this is what he shared. He said, he said you've had a three and a half year period of time of an unusual assault on your family. And I don't know how many of you might know this, but my daughter was within a day, uh, within 24 hours of death. You're two years ago this month. My mom, within three days, the exact same, within 24 hours, almost lost. I was overseas. And uh, that was, that's rough news to get while you're, you're uh, somewhere else, you know. And then Brian went through, it, through his rough, rough thing. And um, just each, it seems like each family member went through something unusually weird and strange. Now, you, you have to understand, I, I really do not live devil-focused at all. I... I, I know he exists, but you know he's not he's not worthy of my conversation. I I only I only talk about him long enough to get the crosshair settled on his forehead. You know, that's it's just it's the only the only purpose for bringing him up is so that I can pull the trigger. I mean, honestly, that's uh, uh, he 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 just uh, he annoys me. He annoys me so much I refuse to give him credit for anything. Ugh. She reminds me when Sayla was little. She, you heard her growling at, at Halloween. She hears this growling. She turns around. Sayla standing in front of this Hollywood, uh, Holly, Halloween display in a drugstore, and she's growling at the rich, witch. You know, that's that's the way we raise our kids. That growl. Uh, uh. So Michael anyway called me out and and uh, and began to prophesy over me, and he said, "You've been under this three and a half year period." Of, uh, of assault, and he says it has ended. And then he went on and he said, what annoyed the end, now Michael would have no way of knowing this. He, w- he wouldn't know about what's happened in the family either. But he's, he, he would have no way of knowing this. He said, what annoyed the enemy the most is that in the midst of your, your darkest, deepest moments, you just laid on your bed and gave thanks to God for his goodness. And that's true. That's true. There was an unusual grace. See, he walks with us. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, there are measures of his presence that you can only find there. There are measures of his presence you can only find there, walking through. That's where you find him. And there was such a grace in that moment. And I I remember just laying in my bed or in my recliner and just unable to really function for a, a, a season. 
and just reviewing promises, reviewing, reading through the word, just refreshing myself in God's goodness, giving, giving him thanks for such an amazing family, a church family, a, my natural family, and just taking, grabbing your moment to just celebrate his kindness and his goodness. It does something to just settle, settle the fear things. You know, it's, it's like, well, I came out of the whole deal. I've told you this before, but I repeat. I came out of the whole deal realizing it was all about trust. Bold faith stands on the shoulders of quiet trust. All God was looking for from me was just to hold the course and trust him. That was it. I was looking for great demonstrations of faith. I was looking for great demonstrations of breakthrough. And the only thing I, the only thing I had was to be quiet and just cultivate trust. Brian, my son, says it best. He says, if all you're left with is God, consider that a gift. That's the truth. That's the truth. Discovering him in those moments is everything. So what, what is he looking for, for you and me? Every one of us have issues, things that are going on positive, some are challenges, some are horrible, but we all got stuff. And in the middle of that, to maintain a real quiet spirit in the presence of the Lord, where trust is constantly cultivated. The great bold faith, all those things, they'll take their place, but just maintain the absolute confidence that God is who he says he is, and that he is good, and that his promises will endure over any situation. And somehow maintaining that one thing has a domino effect on the rest of life. I love bold faith. I, I, was, I was raised in a house hearing the stories of Smith Wigglesworth and all these people in my fam family's history. And I loved seeing different friends of mine through the years, Mario Morello and others, <clears throat> that exhibited such bold faith. And that's always been my ambition, is to live with and demonstrate bold faith. And it happens. But I found out what God is interested in. He's interested in that quiet trust that just does not move regardless of circumstances, does not fall into question regardless of surroundings. So Father, I pray that. I pray that for us as a, as a family, that you would, you would once again release grace. Once again, you would release that grace, that gift over our lives, that quiet trust would become so deep and bring about such a profound stability that nothing could challenge our thinking, our affection, our confidence in you. Thank you, Lord. Thanks so much. Whenever we come together, <clears throat> there's always high chances that we have, when we have this many people in a room, that we have folks here who just simply don't know the Lord. And the most important thing that could happen today would be for anyone here who is not certain about their relationship with Christ to pray a very simple prayer of faith. It's a prayer of surrender. It's a prayer of yieldedness. It's acknowledging who he is. It's surrendering to his lordship. It's, it's his, his ability to rule over our lives, goodness, in such a gracious manner causing us to become everything he created us to become. But it comes in that point of surrender. And what I want to ask is if there's anyone here that would just say, Bill, I don't want to leave this building. I don't want to leave this property until I know that I am right with God, until I know I've been forgiven of sin. If that's you, I want you just to put a hand up right where you are. I want to just acknowledge you just real quickly. Let our eyes meet right here. Yep, wonderful. Amen. Anyone else? Real quickly. Okay, is there any, anyone else? All right. All right. Go ahead and stand. We're going to have a, a ministry team. If you would come on up here. I've got friends over here that would, I would love to have. I, I, I trust them. And I'd love to have them come and pray for you. So just come on down here. And, and uh, yeah, bless this one as she comes. So wonderful to have people. Come yeah, right over here to my right. Anyone else who, 
who would like to, we're going to have a team down here to pray for you. Miracles in your body, whatever is needed, we've got a team ready to go. But specifically over here to my right, we have what's called the Freedom Banner. And people are there ready to pray with you to meet the Lord Jesus, to know what it is to be born again. Ministry team, come quickly. Uh, we want to give uh, a chance for people to receive prayer and, uh, and get their miracles.